All right, hello, DragonCon. Thank you for coming. Uh, first thing, thank you for being on time. I appreciate that. Everyone was here. Uh, my name is Ray Kelly. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on, on me, uh, I'm a practice principal at HP Enterprise in our Fortify group. So we do application security in the cloud uh, as a SaaS offering. So companies give us their mobile apps or their websites to hack for them. And then uh, we give them back the vulnerabilities. Been a developer for 20 years, 15 of which was on uh, in security. And I started off in security on an application called WebInspect, which was an app we did as a startup at Spy Dynamics, where you'd basically point the app at a website and it would go hack it for you <laughs> in an automated fashion to help your testers find vulnerabilities. And also led our uh, mobile penetration team for two years there as well. And look me up on Twitter. Uh, I would like to start with this, talking about insecure uh, devices. I was watching the show on the History Channel one uh, while back, back when they actually showed shows on history on the History Channel and not reality shows. And they were doing this episode on the Cold War. And they brought up this paper shredder. And I'm thinking, what in the world is this all about? And so this particular paper shredder, though, uh, was located uh, near the Capitol and near the White House in a hotel where all the dignitaries would stay from all the different countries. You know, so you had uh, presidents, kings, queens, whatever, all the big players. And the hotel room was kind enough to offer you a paper shredder because you got to shred your important documents when you're out there. And so the thing, though, is this was made by some government three-letter acronym, this paper shredder. And what actually happened is they had built a scanner inside the shredder and as they're shredding their document it's being scanned and it would actually send the the document over the electrical line almost like a modem like with pulses of electricity and that's how they would because there was no ethernet or anything back then uh so i thought that is awesome <laughs> i'm down with that <laughs> so uh a a few things before we get started. Uh, this is a little bit different panel than probably you guys are used to. What I'm going to do is go through a, a, a short presentation and scare you all to death with some of the things we've seen as far as mobile apps go. And then afterwards, we can turn the lights on and do kind of the normal pan, you know, question and answer thing. Um, so if you have an overall question, maybe hold that till the end. Uh, if there's a question on a specific slide or an example, just let me know. Maybe we can handle that when that comes up. Uh, all the vulnerabilities you're going to see are either already publicly disclosed or they are fixed and they're private, but the data has been scrubbed. So you won't see any O days here or anything, no, no, nothing exciting like that. So just want to make sure it's clear that this stuff's already out there. Also, th what's important about this talk is it's about developer mistakes. We're not talking about uh, hacks within the OS on the physical device and the chips. We're talking about just simple things that developers do wrong, which makes their apps vulnerable. And these developers are not trying to do harm, and we'll get into that a little bit, but you know, they're not trying to be malicious. So this is also is not malicious company putting up a, a mobile app in the fake Google store where you download it and all of a sudden you're ransomware and, and what have you. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many developers do we have here? All right. How about QA? Any QA anal analysts? Yes. This is great for you guys. People just scared they're going to get owned? Okay. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to mobile apps, there's a few things that makes it unique and why security vulnerabilities come, up, uh, come about. Right now it's hot, right? Who doesn't have a mobile app? Everyone's trying to get to mobile, and they're trying to get it as fast as they can. If you're a developer and at your company, what is it? Hey, we need a mobile app and we need it out the door now. You know, we're doing marketing pushes and developers feel under pressure to get these apps out. They're also very easy to code these days. You know, you have these uh, things like uh, Cordova or Xamarin, even Windows guys like myself can write mobile apps now for, now for iOS. So that's incredibly scary when they can do that. So uh, the entry level into creating apps is so much easier and they just don't have the training on security or know what to look for. So Guys are just throwing apps together, tossing them out there, and kind of hoping for the best with no regard to security. <laughs> Another assumption that mobile developers make is a big one, and we'll see examples of this, is back-end APIs. You know, so your mobile app is going to talk to some service in the cloud, typically, and they don't ever think to check that for vulnerabilities. Now, they may look at their, their mobile app and say, yeah, this looks pretty good, but they're not checking their back-end app. 
And usually the excuse is, well, it's not going to get indexed by Google. Who's going to go find this API? Well, the bad guys are going to find that API <laughs> and steal your entire database. So again, it's sort of just an educational thing and trying to teach people about that. So the thing that makes mobile apps hard, uh, do we have any security penetration testers here? One, all right, you had a couple, okay. Uh, so typically we think of penetration testing as a web server. We're hacking a backend server. And that's pretty straightforward. There's a target, right? There's an endpoint, I'm gonna go get it. With mobile apps, we have three different areas that you have to look at to make sure it's secure. We're looking at the client, so we're actually looking at the device. We're looking things like, are we storing data unencrypted on there? Um, are we leaking third-party data somewhere, uh, data? So um, poor certificate management. Again, I'll have examples of each of these. The next layer, we're looking at the network layer. S very simple things. Are they pinning their certificates? Are they even using SSL? I mean, that sounds crazy that they're not, but you, we find that a lot more than you would think. So uh, looking for those things on the network, and then on the server side, we're looking for all the same things that you would find in a typical web application assessment, looking for SQL injection, cross-site scripting, uh, things that can just really harm a server. So that's why mobile's a little bit difficult and why there's so, you read almost every week there's a new application and all of a sudden, oh, this data just got stolen because of this mobile app. And, and this is why, because it's, it's much more difficult to test accurately for mobile apps. So we're gonna start kind of backwards. Uh, here's where we get into real examples, okay? So we'll start on the server side. Uh, this is where, again, like I just said, you're looking for SQL injection, cross-site scripting, web dev, arbitrary file upload. And so this was a, an example test that we had where the uh, mobile app would talk to the backend server. Well, the server just flat out allowed the put command and we could upload any file we wanted to to their backend server to this company. And so the idea is that, you know, as an example, this was actually what we did for the customer. We uploaded this link and say, look, now what we need to do is send this link and spam and people click evil link and all of a sudden now we're using their server to distribute our malware. And this was meant for a mobile backend. You know, it had nothing to do with us actually going to this site, but we were able to find it. So this just came out last week, right, or this week. Instagram API, six million phone numbers and email addresses were leaked online. So, and this came because of the Instagram API. Again, a backend service that wasn't meant to be hit by somebody browsing the web or just a web hacker. Um, so again, another example of data leakage through a backend API. This one was really egregious. <laughs> so this, uh, there is an app called Bright City. And again, I'm, telling, I'm saying these because they're already publicly disclosed and hopefully fixed. But um, yeah, hopefully. And this was an application that this company would sell to cities. So they would allow them to pay their electric bills online. They would allow them to pay tickets online. To, they had a section where you can upload everything in your house. Uh, I can't remember what they called it, if I can see it. The uh, uh, prop property management where if you wanted for insurance reasons you just want somebody to keep all your expensive property a list of things so they would allow you to do that and uh, this API exposed everything and here is the example first of all there was um, the API did not even validate authentication there was no authentication on the API basically you post you can see get user at the top and you put your user ID in there and it would come back you put any user ID in there and their data would come back. And if you look at this list here, and we, oh my goodness, oh, let's find out. we get to the juicy stuff down there, you have last name, cell phone, email, date of birth, username, password, the entire <laughs> section just got dumped out into, the, into your browser. So again, this was a mobile app, but it was trying to use a backend service that they gave just no regard to security. So uh, I really liked this one. That was a good one. Any questions so far? Uh, we're kind of blowing through this. That's great. What's that? No, I don't believe they did. I don't think so. I'm, and I'm not even sure uh, 
uh, we definitely have other panelists here about what is suable because of bad coding. Right, that's what I'm thinking. Right, no recourse, right? Uh, the question was, did they get sued? Not liable because of a code issue, so you can't sue for bad programming is, is the thought. And again, maybe that's something for 201 tonight, if anyone's coming to 201. We got, definitely have the lawyer guys with us and can definitely answer that uh, better than I can. Compensated for the money that, that you're lost, but you can't just kind of just go out and start suing. You know. Have to find some damages, right? So that's probably a good question for tonight because I'm, I'm really interested too in a, a solid answer on that. You know, how far, you know, how much uh, recourse do we have as consumers of this app, right? You didn't do anything wrong. You're just using this app that was horribly coded. And so, you know, what are you going to do? Okay. Still, the laws are still being developed to protect consumers. Uh, I actually think all of that's in the EULA. Like, liability is either going to be vested in your license. You, you read that? I mean, I certainly <laughs> didn't. And I know there's uh, plenty of uh, cases that have shown that that isn't necessarily, like, there's no legal founding in using EULA. There have been cases that have shown that. But at the end of the day, it's where the developer is vested. Like, you actually own the license, you own the software, you don't own either. And then they have to figure out where they've vested the liability in your license or the software itself. Or so. Right. Thank you. All right, so let's move our way back down a level now. Now we're at the network level. And this is where we're looking for clear text transmissions of data. So usernames and passwords, not over SSL, not encrypted. We're looking for third party data leakage. Uh, and the part that's tough about this on a mobile app, remember we're good guys here, okay? So imagine yourself as a QA person in your company and they're giving you a mobile app. Their, your own mobile app for your company. They say, I need you to test this for security vulnerabilities. You know, that's the mindset that, that I'm kind of presenting here for you. And one of the challenges is getting into the middle of the transmission because the developers are going to tell you what all the API calls are, what's valid values. As a QA analyst or as a security analyst, you know, if you're part of Red Team, you need to go figure that out. And so capturing the traffic over the wire is very important to do a valid backend test, okay? So this is an example here, and it's impossible to read, uh, which is fine, uh, but you can see here. So this uh, particular tester, he was testing a mobile app for a big time boy band. Think of like New Kids on the Block. Any fans? No, no New Kids fans? Okay, so uh, their target demographic is like 14-year-old girls. And so he was testing this mobile app, and he's, he's proxying the traffic, and he's just sort of watching things go by as he's using the app. And something catches his eyes that flies by, like, what in the world was that? And he looks, and he sees in the payload that's going from the device to the server his home address down to the street number. He never put it in the app. You know, he created a login, and it said, you know, 1234 here, street, you know, Virginia, zip code, the works. Just shoop, flew by and, and went up to their, this, uh, this boy band server. And so that's in, just incredibly concerning, <laughs> I, I would think. Uh, so we definitely flagged that as a vulnerable. Hey, you shouldn't be doing I don't know if they paid attention to it because I'm sure they knew what they were probably doing uh, to do that. So, yes? So are you saying... I can reject by Just, yeah, just to clarify. I'm in a bad spot for this. Um, are you saying that his personal address was given because of his uh, ISP or... No, it came from the device. So the device probably did GPS lookup as, as, as well as Wi-Fi to determine the location. It probably took a best guess, which is usually pretty close, and then sent that up from the device where he was at oh, that's up to the server. That's terrifying. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's another one. So I was testing an app I wrote, and I'm going to show you all an example. Um, I'm actually open sourcing an app here at DragonCon. So I wrote an app that's going to help test for vulnerabilities, and I'll get into it later. It, 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 it's sort of a really soft release because it doesn't actually exist yet, <laughs> but it, it's going to be awesome. 
So I was testing this app, and this was for a big time social media networking company. Can't say their name. And uh, so again, I'm in the, I'm capturing the network traffic, and all I did was click like one button uh, to look at a post, and this payload gets sent. Look how big this thing is. You can't even read all the text that's in it. But the stuff that's in there, and I have to try to read it too, is uh, all of the running services that are on the device, uh, my screen lock settings, my uh, Wi-Fi name that I'm connected to, the key guard type, whether or not I have a front camera or rear camera on my device. It completely raped my device of all the information and just <laughs> sent it up to this company. And again, had no, and I was, I, I, what in the world was that? I wasn't even looking for it and it just went over the, over the air. So that, that was a bad one. There's actually a, uh, I was gonna say, I have a blog post out there that you might be able to find uh, calling about uh, when devices are mining data, how far can you go uh, without users? I'm sure, like uh, this gentleman said about, you know, did you read the EULA? I'm sure it's in there that you can take all that information, but it's sort of like when you don't expect it and the type of information they're taking from the device is sometimes kind of shocking. Uh, another one, Bose headphones. This one was great. Another one that was kind of recent also. So they had a handy mobile app, right, to configure, you know, the sound, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the muffling of the sound and such. And uh, it was just straight up taking the music you were listening to and sending it to their servers. So they were keeping, a, uh, you know, all the music you were listening to uh, on their servers. And again, people had no idea this was happening. So, uh, again, you know, is it really that big a deal? I don't know, but it certainly seems like they're, pushing the limits is, is the privacy and what they're taking from you. So now we get to the client side, the mobile side. And this, this is where it really gets fun and interesting. <laughs> uh, this is really the big unknown because as a tester, when you use an app, do you know what's really happening? You, can, you kind of don't. Uh, and so that's why it's a challenge. You don't have source code. You can't look at it. So you don't know what's happening. Uh, are, is my data on here safe? Is it being encrypted? SQLite, what kind of database, what kind of information are you storing in the database? So uh, I think it was this year or last year, Starbucks, this was a big one in the press, where Starbucks got busted for having a security issue. And again, it was just a developer mistake. They embedded Crashlytics to crash, uh, track all of their uh, crashes in the app. But what it did is it stored the login form in that data with your form data filled out, which included your username and password. So not only did it store that unencrypted on the device, when the app would crash, it would actually send that to Google, Crashlytics, and in that payload was your username and password. <laughs> so uh, again, I'm sure the developer never thought to even look at it, hey, this is a handy way for me to track crashes, I'll just toss this in here. And you don't know, especially when you start embedding third-party libraries into your apps, you're sort of at the whim of what they're doing at that point. And there's plenty of those out there, right? Yes, on that app for that user, right. Uh, so this one, this one's a little bit older and we used to see this a lot. So we had uh, quite a few banking customers and they had a feature, which I'm sure most of you know now, where you can take a picture of a check or a, a deposit slip and take a picture of it and automatically deposit with your banking app, right? Everyone's kind of familiar with that? What we found several times with these banks that they were actually storing the photos to the global camera roll, not in the sandbox where they belong, so that if anyone ever stole your device or you had a malicious app installed, they would go through your photos and start uploading pictures of checks that were signed with that included routing numbers. And I mean, you just start printing these things off, right? Photoshop and print them off. So that was a, a bad example. We also use, we don't see this much anymore, but it was big. Right now, definitely, thankfully, like Xcode and Java, and they've made it a lot where it makes a lot more sense how to store sensitive information to your app alone. Uh, so that's gotten a lot better. Uh, and this actually shows another example where we told the customer, hey, do not release this to the App Store. They're like, but we're in a hurry, we're in a hurry. Yeah, I, don't, I know you're in a hurry, but do not put this in the App Store. This is terrible. And uh, they said, okay, fine, fine, we'll fix it. So next day they gave us a new binary to test. 
And with that, they said, they said, no, we're submitting this to the app store because we got to get it in there and we're going to push it through. Let us know if you find anything. Okay, great. So we're testing the app and they fixed that vulnerability. So when we took the picture, it, it stored it properly where it went. It was perfect. But they had another feature where you can go through previously submitted checks with swipes. And as you were swiping, it was writing all the photos back to the global camera roll again. <laughs> You know, back, no, do not submit this again. <laughs> so uh, that's an example, though, again, where mobile developers are under pressure from their bosses who just want to get out into the marketplace and get this stuff out there. And security takes a back seat every time. Logging is extremely common. So if, like, uh, so if you're doing uh, Android log.d or, or what have you, um, we see this all the time where developers are coding and they're trying to help themselves figure out something. So they'll you know, output the username and password that I'm, I'm logging in is, and they forget to strip that out of the code before they submit it to the stores. And so while we're testing, you know, you're using Logcat or Xcode, I can't remember what it's called in there, but uh, watching the data from the app as it's running, and all of a sudden you start seeing the sensitive information being dumped out to the screen. Uh, so that's another common mistake. We're not removing log statements. So this one's one of my favorites. So we had a tested a mobile app. It was so secure, it used voice recognition to log into the app. So we tested the app, and you'd say, hi, my name is Ray. And I had recorded that previously, and it would actually let me in, and it worked. I could say anything else. Somebody else could say, hi, my name is Ray. It was awesome. It worked perfectly. So when we tested the app, we decided to look into the directories. By the way, I know people are, might be thinking like, well, how do you get into those directories and stuff? You know, what every test or whatever ha every hacker is going to do is they're going to root or jailbreak your device. And once that happens, all bets are off. <laughs> so that's why we do this, to be as bad as we can be. So we go into the directory where they're storing the data, and we see a random file had, gotten, had been created. And the file name made no sense. It was like zebra.xyz. The extension made no sense. The file made no sense. Couldn't figure it out. We open it up, and it's just all garbage. It's looks clearly like binary data. Well, good. Maybe, you know, they're encrypting it. Maybe, maybe this is not so bad. No problem. But as we looked closer and looked at the very top in the first couple lines, we saw things like genre, year made, album title, MP3. So what we did is uh, took it off the device, put it on the computer, renamed it from XYZ to MP3, held the phone up and hit play. Hi, my name is Ray. And it opened up the app. <laughs> we were able to get into the application that way. <laughs> Uh, the litany of issues there, right? I mean, uh, anyone, suggestions, what was done wrong here? <laughs> obscurity, obscurity, exactly. That's the biggest one, I think, dot XYZ. Well, I'll rename this extension and no one's going to figure it out. That one kills me when I see that because uh, that's the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open that file up and find out what it really is. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, the fact that they stored it, it was an MP3 file, which maybe was okay as long as it was encrypted, on the, so that if I open it and try to play it, it would just be garbage, it wouldn't do anything. That would have been a step better. Maybe taking the audio file and actually storing a hash of the data, not the actual MP3, and check that with the server, send that up, and say, hey, here's a hash, yeah, that matches, you're cool, open it up. So was, there were all kinds of ways this could have been done better, <laughs> you know, in my opinion. Any questions? Well, you got talk box? Uh, I was just, well, maybe we can project that. Catch. Or I can. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I just, on the question, when you're using, saying use a hash for a check, I mean, the, the, the big reason why, why they're, um, they're keeping it uh, local is for speed. If you have to go to a hash, isn't that going to like slow the, the app down or maybe not even make it work? No, because this was just clearly for just login purposes. So, yeah, yeah store, store even the, the hash locally. That still doesn't tell you what, what this audio is. But it's, it's the problem of that's be, that you're now sacrificing uh, application uh, functionality for security, and that's where a lot of these questions go back and forth on. Sure, yeah, I, that's a great point because that does happen. I think in this case, this specific one, it's okay. I mean, that's a second to hash a, a file, right? 
and to store that. I, I think in this case, that could be, and it's only one time when you log in. That, that's the only hit you're going to take. Once you're logged in, you've got your session state, and you can probably go about your business. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's still going to um, but, slow down your login time, though, because you have a process for retrieval and then processing. Yeah, so. no, well, I wouldn't send the MP3 file up. I would do that locally okay. and say, record it, store a hash of the MP, whatever that data was on the device, check only the hash with the server, which is just, I mean, it's going to be 10 characters or you know, whatever, an MD5 or whatever kind of hash you want to use. Okay. Uh, no MD5? No. Right out. <laughs> Uh, here's another one. So another handy mechanism that developers like to do is put in debug screens within the applications. And they don't remove them before they push them to the store. And ideally, normal users like you and I aren't supposed to be able to get to these screens. But malicious people will get to these screens, and they have really uh, scary consequences. And in some of these screens, you can see where I can change, for instance, what server I'm hitting. I may want, I can change to start hitting their development server, their staging server. Uh, this one in the middle, near the bottom, uh, upload log file. We tried that, and it did not validate what file was being uploaded. We could upload anything we wanted to their backend server uh, through this you know, thing that's supposed to be trying to help their developers and their QA teams. Uh, but now we can use that to upload just whatever files we want to upload to their server. You know, I'll upload something that says, please click me.exe, and hopefully someone on their back end, what the heck is this doing in here, and run it, you know, install command and control, call back out to my servers, and I'll, now I'm owning their company. So uh, that, that one was pretty bad also. Just trying to see, there was... There was another one of these here had, I don't even think I captured it on there, it had their like SSL private key embedded in it. I mean, it was, it was really bad. Okay, so now, like I said, uh, th this stuff's hard looking for all those things. And, I, and working with our penetration team, I was like, man, I wish we could make this easier. Everyone kept saying, how do we do this easier? And so I took a look at it and I thought, I wonder with, you know, Android's open source, what if I pull it down and I modify the source code to intercept things that interest me. Things like SQLite queries, what's being written to the device, what data is coming to and from. So uh, that's what I did. I took, the, uh, took Android KitKat, this was a couple years ago when I did the first version of it, and put in modifications and wrote an app around it. And so I'll show you what that looks like. So we'll go ahead and start the emulator. So it's cranking up an Android. It runs based on the emulator. And uh, so this is running the uh, OS that I modified that's running in the emulator right now. And we'll give it just a second to crank up. Hopefully the demo gods are with me today. Come on, baby. Not a great start. Oh, of course. Sorry, guys. Bear with me. Let me try that one more time. This worked before you all came in. <laughs> That's right. There we go. All right, so we can see just opening the device, we're able to look at, boy, that is awful. You cannot read that, can you? Wow. OK, well, I'll explain it as I go. Uh, but this is reading the file access. So this is every file that's been touched since I've opened the device. OK, so a lot of it's just OS type stuff that's not too important for what we're trying to do.
good. Okay, so I'm going to install an app. And what I'm going to install is an app called Goat Droid. Uh, if anyone's familiar with Web Goat, it's a app, it's a web app that's vulnerable to help you guys practice your penetration testing skills. Goat Droid is a mobile app that's vulnerable to help you figure out, you know, learn how to test mobile apps for vulnerabilities. Uh, it's by OWASP, uh, the foundation, so you can go look them up and it'll be on there if you're interested. So I'm going to install this app. Clear the events. And we see we got our four goats here. And I got to do a quick configuration here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. So this is like a, a regular penetration test here. They're going to use the app and try to find vulnerabilities. So let's uh, go droid. Passwords go droid. And I'm going to log in. And I typed in the wrong password. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, that says a lot about my coding skills. Golly, sorry guys, I apologize. I promise this worked. One more time, we're halfway there though. Just need the login to work. Uh, like I was saying, this is this will be open source. So I'm gonna. Uh, there's a page for it on GitHub right now. Uh, it's not a very good sales job I'm doing right now. This. <laughs> Why does this keep locking up? Come on. Oh, wow, I don't think this is going to work for me, guys. I am so sorry. All right, give me one more time, then we'll give up on it. The Mac doesn't like the droids. I'm sure the Mac doesn't like Windows running on it either. <laughs> All right, last one. I was in the process of updating this from KitKat to 7.0 NuGet and just couldn't quite get there before this talk, so, so I brought the buggy one. So far, so good. Okay, we're still good there. All right, here we go. No whammies. But before it crashes again, let me point this out. So here, we just see, we can see the uh, web request that went out to validate. Um, and you can see, well, you may not be able to see, but it is SSL. So the idea that I'm inside the operating system, I can get to the data before it's encrypted. And be able, so I don't have to worry about certificate pinning and validating. So it's a lot easier to be able to uh, trap this information. If I look at file access, uh, I'm looking through this list here. Well, actually, let me try to log in correctly. I don't understand why that's not. Man, I know it is. I know it's Goat Droid. I've been using that. God. That is bizarre. I swear that worked. <laughs> Edit your config, sis. Uh, but anyway, so in between, uh, I'm not sure what's going on there, but I think there's enough stuff here to show. So here's a SQLite events that are happening. So things are being stored. So what I can do is actually double click this 
And what it did was just pull the file off the device into a browser where I can now start going through the, uh, through the data. And if I look here, had the login had worked, I would have seen my login, my session token, an is admin flag is on there, which really interests me as well. Uh, so this is this application's database that I'm able to go and pull off and look at. And so as a tester, especially the is admin, you know, it says false by default, of course, I may want to try changing it to true, shove it back onto the device and reopen the application and see if I can get to any of those screens that you saw earlier that I had shown you. Um, so uh, that is an example. And this thing does store the username and password unencrypted, but because I could not get logged in, I cannot show that. Um, so I know the back end's running. One more time. Well, okay, we'll pass on that one. So anyways, hopefully I'll, I'll get this thing working and get it posted for people to use. Uh, and maybe tonight at Hacking 201 I can get it working right and do another demo where it actually works. So that's kind of the end of the presentation phase. If we want to go to questions, if you want to turn the lights on, we can, uh, we can do that. So the organization that I'm a part of, we make mobile applications for certain industries where the internet connection is questionable at best. So we need to have a way to debug the application when it's disconnected at a remote location. Uh, in situations like that, we've had to use the debug option, like build, build in a debug screen in the application. Absolutely. How do you have a recommendation on a better way of doing this? Maybe like remote debugging or something like that? Uh, no, just How you deal with that? have the developers remove the activity, for instance, from the app before they submit it to the store, right? Maybe conditional compile that activity in uh, would be a, probably a better solution. And I totally get that. Uh, one of the debug screens, one of the biggest purposes of that that I've seen is because companies don't want to buy a bunch of SSL certificates, right? They don't want to buy one for their QA box or staging box. And, and so what they do is, cool, I'll give you an option where you can turn off SSL and use the app or pick a different server. But again, they forget to undo that before they go to the app store. And we see that a lot too. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I followed the box. <laughs> hey, um, I'm actually a former corporate trainer for Apple. I spent five years as a field trainer, and now I'm currently with AirWatch. I specialize in NDM EMM deployment uh, for our partner support. And one of the things I have a question about is, I, I guess in terms of uh, launching a for, for mobile enterprise aspect, if you have like an internal app catalog, how, uh, how, how I guess how important is it for internally developed applications on mobile devices that are used for like uh, corporations? How, how 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 much attention should they really be paying to security in that aspect? Yeah, I would say just as much as any other app, right? Because your employee could lose their phone easily, right? And now, even though it's only a private app to your company, now somebody else has access to it, right? Uh, or even the back-end server that that app is connecting to may not be private. It's, it's more than likely a public server, although the app is private to your own app store, right? Um, what it's communicating with may not be. And so I, I would certainly treat those just as importantly as any app in the public app store. Just wondering if the signs will be available online? I don't, do we do that? Do you want to email it to me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hi there. Uh, so while we're on the topic of uh, SSL certificates and the such, uh, basically at my company we have a vendor who has a production server that communicates with some of our equipment internally, and they keep getting blocked because they you're they're using a self-signed SSL mm -hmm. certificate. Yeah. I personally like I don't want to make that exception, but of course that's not my call to make, so I, I'm not the manager. Um, but I, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to sit down and mess with, but I don't know what kind of vulnerabilities or problems come with an invalid or self-signed SSL certificate. So if you could cover that, that'd be super great. Sure. The biggest one, really the only one you have to worry about is man in the middle, 
if you're not validating the cert and you go to any shady Wi-Fi and you hook up and they're not validating the certificate, you, your info is being stolen. Everything leaving the device to the backend server is being stolen if you do not do SSL certificate pinning correctly. So uh, that, that's the vulnerability pretty much. Hi, uh, I had a question. In your experience, uh, how many of the vulnerability issues that you've seen have been due to lack of training or just pressure to put the apps out there versus actual like difficult technical issues that might have not been resolved or ca caught as easily? Sure, uh, that's a little bit hard to measure because we just kind of see the mistakes. We don't necessarily know why they're happening. My guess, though, is the first one would be training, just understanding of security, understanding what I just showed you guys here, how that stuff works. It's really not hard to, con you know, when you see it, just, again, mobile developers just, they're using Cordova and just drag and dropping applications together. Oh, yeah, woo, shove it on out. Uh, so I think it comes more to training versus pressure. Pressure is there for big corporate companies, but other people, you know, maybe it's just, just lack of knowledge. Um, I just wanted to add something to the question about uh, internal apps and stuff. Uh, I have several businesses here in town. Someone left their laptop in their car. It obviously wasn't there when they went back. Uh, not only did they have a quarter of a million people's personal information down to their social security number from their corporate app on their laptop, unencrypted, they lost right. all of that, social security numbers, everything. Uh, no, you treat it just like it was a public server. Yep, exactly. Thank you. That's great. Not the vulnerability, but uh, that's a good story. <laughs> I was just wondering if there's any real way as a user to protect ourselves. I mean, obviously, not everybody would be able to uh, program like a Faraday cage for their phone. But uh, what would the best way to protect ourselves as users be against improper coding? Yeah, I was dreading this question because <laughs> there's not a good answer. You know, when there's malicious apps that are intentionally trying to harm you, there's things, right? Don't click on links. Don't download from app stores you're not supposed to be downloading from. That's pretty straightforward. But this is just straight up developer mistakes that you're just at their whim of how they coded the app. They weren't trying to harm you. It's in the legit app store. You're sort of at a loss at that point, other than don't use the app. You know, look at all the Instagram users, right? I mean, what, what were you gonna do? Not use the app. So that, that's, that one's tough. How do you protect yourself against legit applications that are coded poorly? Then do you know of any applications that are, would be like an electronic Faraday cage, basically, that would prevent unauthorized sending of all that or is that no. just fantasy no th then your app doesn't work it, it doesn't do what you want it to do right because you can't communicate i mean okay. if it's communicating you got to have that yeah. so is it possible to have like a cell phone daisy chained to your cell phone that you own and it does nothing but monitor your cell phone for that kind of crap basically uh, <laughs> i've heard people doing that but i've never seen it yeah, I don't know. That sounds kind of shady to me. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, not sure that would be a good way to – and how many people would go through the trouble to even kind of set that up. Uh, and, again, it doesn't protect the back-end server, your data that's on the back-end. Again, the Instagram hack was an example. You know, whatever you did to your device, it, it doesn't matter. That service is out there in the cloud, and they're stealing your information, even though it was supposed to be meant for a mobile app. So that's, that's secondary cell phone, you wouldn't do it. Right, right. Hang on. Oh boy. Come on, put some arm into it. <laughs> uh, this may be similar to what you already answered, but uh, say for Android, do you know of any app that um, will control what, um, what the other apps on the phone can send out or are allowed to access uh, within the phone? Correct. There certainly are apps for that, especially on Android. Unfortunately, that doesn't help you here because these aren't malicious in nature, remember. It's, it's not looking for malware. You know, links going to .cn or .russia. These look like legitimate requests that are happening, for instance. So it's... What, what apps will do that in case of malicious uh, ones? Uh, I don't know them off the top of my head. There, there's quite a few, though. I don't, maybe if someone else knows. Anyone run uh, 
an app on their Android that looks for other malicious apps by any chance? No. They, they do exist, though. I just don't know their names. Yeah. Were you involved in developing any or uh, kind of testing the DragonCon app to see if it's secure? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I, can't, I cannot say whether or not I contributed to, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I did. I took a peek at it, and it, it was not horrible, so uh, it was okay. I, w I was hoping for something juicy here at the conference, but. Uh. So I'm wondering, is this something that uh, maybe, this would be up for like the app stores and stuff to do, but if anyone's thought about it, is maybe have some kind of a certification saying, you know, hey, these apps, you know, before you download, have, you know, running the TLS correct version, SSL hashing, have all that enabled, and then have provide a warning to users saying, hey, you're about to download an app that doesn't have XYZ, as a warning, I don't know if anything once thought about that for any of the app stores like Apple or anyone. Yeah, it, it's that, it's tough for the app store to do that because they don't know what the intent of your code is, or even know what the code is. Right, once it's compiled to a binary, you can get you can get some information out of the binary, but for all intents and purposes, you don't know the full intent of it. So it would be tough for an app store to keep look for developer mistakes like that without source code or testing it, going through kind of what we just did. And they just don't have the resources to test that many apps. Uh, for those of us that are going to be self-taught or even attended a coding boot camp, uh, we don't have a formal CS degree, uh, do you have any resources that you could give us so that we could be better acquainted with best security practices in terms of developing applications? Absolutely. OWASP.org, O-W-A-S-P.org is a big one. Um, tons of resources there for web application, uh, especially for web application uh, testing. And they, and Hacking 201, that's a great question for the panel tonight. They, they'll definitely have others uh, in different, in other realms like hardware and, and such. But uh, for web applications specifically, what we're doing here, OWASP is a good, great resource for that. So it won't protect you from developer mistakes, but when you download an app and it asks you for permission to access your contacts, your photos, your music, and it's a game like Solitaire, sure. mm -hmm. don't do it. Right. <laughs> Right? Yeah. So, you know, just, <laughs> you got to read some of this stuff. Dragon Con yourself. app, he said, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you might have already uh, answered this when uh, that gentleman over there asked about the, and you answered the OWASP thing, but uh, specifically, I'm a pen tester, for a cybersecurity consulting company, um, junior pen tester. But the question is uh, for mobile application, I don't really have much experience with it. How would I get more in? I guess started into introduction. Like you mentioned, Goat OS earlier. Earlier, what other uh, sources sources out there? Uh, th there there is a good bit of reading that's out there. It's not as big, of course, as web app uh, information that's that's out. But um, and that's why it's such a, a niche market. Mobile app testing. Not a lot of people are doing it. Not a lot of companies are doing it. So uh, again, OWASP is a good resource. That Goat Droid is their app. And so there's documentation to it to say, hey, here's how you test for this, here's how you test for this. Um, and they have also a mobile top 10, so they keep track of the top 10 mobile vulnerabilities that are out right now. Uh, and they try to keep that updated, I believe. So that, that's pretty much the resource that I go to. So I used uh, similar tools to what you've just discussed to just look at some IoT devices around the house, and you would be amazed at the the special practices used there. Uh, is OWASP, can you recommend any tool sets or, you know, I, I have my personal tool chest, but I'd love to hear any recommendations you have for tool sets, et cetera. For IoT or? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, IoT. I'm not. I haven't played too much with it. I actually started my own scanner for scanning for IoT, but then found out kind of everyone else is doing it, so I kind of gave up on it. But uh, but yeah, I had that situation too where I was testing the app that I wrote to scan for IoT devices, and this thing came. back. I, I was testing it in my house, right? I'm just saying, okay, now let's go scan my range uh, of all the IP addresses in my house, and this device came back, and I didn't know what it was. I had no clue. And I was like, I do not, I know I do not have a server running on that address. What the hell is that? And so I go to it, and it actually had a web page, and it had stuff like Pandora 
and things. I, what in the, I could not figure out what it was, and it was in my house. And what it was was my Onkyo stereo receiver. I had plugged it in for firmware updates into the network. Well, it was running its own web server as well on that, that you could go and drive that thing. I, what in the, how did I not know this has been running for a year in my house? And is it vulnerable to anything? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. Hi, I own a cell phone repair store, so I have people in all the time who um, have downloaded anything, you know, everything on Android free. Oh, so yeah. So, of course, they show up and they're like, my phone won't turn on, you know, and so I have to wipe. But a lot of times, um, I've found that for the layman people to... I'm, I'm sure this is not, but if you have friends who are stupid and they do that all the time, I give them Security Master. Everyone walks in and they've downloaded stupid stuff. They don't pay for it. That's the problem with this app is because you can't pay for it to get the ad off the front. But you can't pay for it, but it actually keeps them, like it'll re if somebody wants to redirect, it won't let them. It'll tell them, you are being redirected to a bad website. You are being, it's trying to send you here. Would you still like to go? Right. Do you know what you're doing type deal? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a pain in the butt on the first homepage when you have to swipe it. And I wish they'd just charge me $30. I don't care. Right, right. You know, but they won't. But anyway, it's called um, Security Master. Okay. So, and I'm, I'm sure there's other things, but somebody asked the question and nobody had the answer. Exactly, yeah. And so that's what I put on every one of my people who walk in and they've done something stupid or tell them they've been hacked because they did porn and they're swearing they didn't or whatever. <laughs> you know, How did that get I, there? I do not. I don't judge. I just, right. you know, try to fix. <laughs> I got a question about uh, load testing or AKA performance testing. Can you break the back end by just like uh, like using browser stack and some sort sure. of automation tool and just pound it? Other than denial of service or? <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. uh, but sure. Uh, we do that, use that technique as well. And usually what we're trying to throw is a server error of some kind that will dump some information to give us more info about what's running on the back end. And so a lot of servers, when they'll hit a load, like IIS will puke or what have you, and throw out this huge error message. And from that, that gives us info as penetration testers how to go to the next step. Oh, okay, I see here that we threw this type of error, and that'll give us more information. Are, so, Are you talking about uh, REST API testing? Sure, uh, yeah, anything. Oh, okay. uh, REST is great for 500 server errors. You throw any garbage oh. <laughs> submission to a, a REST service, and usually it'll, it'll yak on you with some error message that may give you, you know, invalid XYZ field. Okay, XYZ field, that must be, okay, let me start poking on that field. Um, so yeah, using error messages is a great way for, uh, for pen testing. And putting a server under load is a great way to get those error messages. Question? Anybody? Is there um, any like particular operating system like iOS or Android that you found more vulnerabilities? Man, I hate that question too. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm I'm like very basic, so I'm yeah. Not, no, no, so. I'm saying it's because it's a, a question that is never right. I mean, um, I mean, just based off all the testing, for what um, we're talking about here, there neither one is because it's not malicious, right? I, I think oh. Apple does a better job at at uh, validating apps that are submitted in looking for malicious links like within apps and such, and that's probably why they take five freaking days for an app review, they take forever. Where Google, it's out in like an hour, um, literally. So, I, and of course, I think Android's a little bit more well known for malicious apps, you know, fake apps that are running. So, um, as far as malicious activity, I think Apple may have the lead there, but for the topic of this conversation, because a developer, did something stupid and didn't right. use SSL, it's it's agnostic to platform, really. Okay. It can be even Windows Phone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was asking because I just noticed, like, some some apps are, like, available on tablets, but they're not on smartphones or vice versa. So, I mean, that's just why I was asking that. Right, right. Hi. Um, 
Do you have any tips for securing backend APIs besides just making sure they're behind to HTTPS? Validate your inputs. Validate inputs. Validate inputs, because uh, that's that's number one. So, uh, so should I not? Should we not be too wordy with our errors? Like you mentioned, field X Y Z. You should be about. very worried about your errors. Don't don't throw any errors to the user. You know, show a nice page. Sorry, something so bad happened. Something bad happened. Yeah, not the no full, details. not a full <laughs> SQL statement. You know that you tried to execute. I've seen this. <laughs> uh, you know, where they actually sorry, we had trouble running the query. Select star this is from what our users. Database looks like. <laughs> Uh, but validating inputs, that, that's clearly the, that's like number one for me. And use whitelisting, not blacklisting. So yeah. if you have a zip code field, you know, make sure it's only numbers, five characters, you know, don't say don't allow tick mark, don't allow less than sign, just say only what, numbers. What <laughs> I want, not, yeah. You know there's no stupid questions except the unanswered ones. <laughs> what was the most egregious security vulnerability, in your opinion, that you've come across yourself? Oh, that I've come across. Uh, <laughs> funny story. So uh, I was at a small company, and we were acquired We when we did this startup. And um, so... We got into the collective, into this very large organization, and I was a manager at that time, so I had employees. And they had a helpful web portal where I can go in and, you know, manage my employees. And some of those things were, you know, adjust their salary, give them stock options and such. And I thought, well, I wonder how this thing's working. <laughs> and so I started poking around a little and found out that uh, they were simply using an employee ID to pull up my employee, okay? I thought, well, let me just increment it by one and let's see what happens. And some random guy showed up with his salary on my screen. That did not work for me. All right, let's go to the next one. And so, and I'm just iterating through the entire company of 200,000 employees. Uh, and so that was bad, but I'll tell you what's even, what my favorite part of that was is, okay, I don't want all these scrub workers, man. I want the CEO, I, I, want, the, I want the money guys, right? So I was like, how am I gonna figure that out? And uh, I went to, they had a portal like most big companies have, you know, go to home.yourcompany.com and they had a search bar in there. And I thought, well, let me just try this. And I put in my employee number in the search bar and hit go. And an Excel spreadsheet came back that had been indexed with everybody's employee number in the entire company. <laughs> and so I, now I had the keys to everything and everyone at that point. Uh, so anyway, that was pretty fun. <laughs> Uh, we actually presented it at one of their big conference security conferences, and they fixed it immediately after that. <laughs> All right, so I know that you do a lot of testing for apps that are built by other developers, but I was wondering if you could comment on any like vulnerabilities within like the native SDKs for iOS, Android, Xamarin, Cordova. Like, can we trust that they're going to be doing the right things, or? That is Should we a, be working to like a different platform rather than the like Cordova? That's a great question, and I, that's an area I actually want to do some research. I don't think a lot of research has been done on that, uh, especially like Xamarin. I'm a big Xamarin fan, yeah. but I have no idea how they're compiling that code down to the native code. And who knows what they're doing, and that's a great question. And I don't have an answer for you, but it's, it's something I definitely want to dive into. One minute. Sorry about that. Uh, no worry. Uh, quick on time. Anyways, uh, so going back to what you just said about what happened with your employer, uh, that brings up another great issue. How do you broach the incompetence of your superiors without getting fired or in trouble? <laughs> sure, exactly. And and once it got out, like the people, like the sales team were cool with the presentation that we gave. But after we gave it, then we got the call from the lawyer people, and they they weren't on board with this. <laughs> so uh, it ended up all being okay, but you're right at that point you're at the whim of, of your company and hopefully they, they take notice and and if you show them how bad it is they usually will I think uh, by the way if, if you guys leave 201 is tonight uh, and if you have more questions bring them with you I'll be on the panel there too and with some other great folks too go ahead oh is that it are we out of time yeah. all right thank you everyone hope to see you tonight <laughs>